Well, I guess we're all here, so uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we pray that as we look at John's Gospel that you will give us understanding and insight. I pray that you would help me to be clear in my words. We pray that you would be glorified and that we would come away with a better understanding of John's Gospel and how it's put together that uh, we might be bold with the message of life to a lost and dying world. We thank you for this conference, for all those that are here that were able to uh, consider your word, and we pray that uh, you would be glorified through it. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. There was a farmer in uh, Nebraska who was quite impressed with the reliability of the Ford Model T and the Ford Model TT truck. And so when he wanted to buy a tractor, he made sure that it also was a Ford. So Wilmot uh, Crozier, or Crozier, don't know which way he pronounced it, uh, went out and bought a Ford tractor. Now, if this Ford tractor does not look like any Ford tractor you've ever seen, it's because it's Ford of Minneapolis, Minnesota. This tractor was so bad that Mr. Crozier approached the University of Nebraska and said, could you set up a test facility so that the bad tractors can be weeded out and people don't end up buying junk like this. His tractor was the very first tractor tested at the Nebraska test station. And so manufacturers send tractors out there without air cleaners they want, and so forth. They wanted to get the maximum horsepower so they don't want any uh, restriction on the airflow. Uh, you can't buy the tractors that go through their tests, but uh, you can later on buy uh, improved versions that come out. Henry Ford was so shaken by this experience that he did not call his tractors Fords. Uh, they came out with Ford since, by the way, Ford of Minneapolis had an employee by the name of Ford, but he wasn't even an owner in the company. So they figured that there wouldn't be anyone who would ever come up with the name Fordson because they didn't know of anyone that had the last name Fordson. When we are looking at the message of life, we want something reliable. We don't want something that doesn't pass the Nebraska tractor test. <laughs> and the message that's going to be reliable will start from the Gospel of John, the one book that is designed for those that have not yet believed in Jesus Christ for everlasting life. Zane Hodges was a champion of the Gospel of John and of the message of life that proceeds out of it. He said, the Gospel of John, which claims to be written to bring men to faith and eternal life, never once mentions repentance, still less does it uh, make it a condition for eternal life along with faith. If John really believed that to be saved, one must repent and believe, it staggers the mind to consider that he never manages to say so in 21 chapters of his gospel. By contrast, he says over and over that one must believe. If you use either the majority text or a version that is a translation of the Texas Receptus, the word pistuo that's normally translated believe shows up 100 times. If you have a defective text, <laughs> it will only have it 98 times. <laughs> but the Gospel of John uses the word believe 100 times. Now I have shelves of commentaries on the Gospel of John. I am writing a commentary on John's Gospel. And so we are going to look at outline issues just as we did in my previous paper is I'm wrestling with outline and I'm wrestling with translation and I have about 2,000 notes in my translation for things that I need to make sure to cover 
in my discussion. But my favorite commentary is the one that Zane started and death uh, prevented him from completing it. But one very nice thing that he left for us was his outline of the entire book. Zane and I had many, many, many interactions over the years over John's Gospel and over the outline in John. In Zane's earlier writings, before I wrote The Cross in John's Gospel, which appears in Jot Guess in the Journal of uh, GES, Zane argued that there were seven signs. Uh, after that article, he started arguing that there are eight signs in the Gospel of John. Well then, uh, out of that, we started having discussions between ourselves. How does John 13 through 17 fit into the book? And we both argued that it leads up to the eighth sign, the cross and resurrection. It's setting the groundwork for it. Uh, my first sentence in the article that appeared in the journal needs to be rewritten. In fact, the whole article needs to be rewritten. As I start out in my first sentence saying that the sign section of John is chapters 1 through 12 and 18 through 20. I am in full agreement with Zane Hodges that the entire book revolves around signs the whole book. The outline that is here in uh, Faith in His Name, Zane's commentary on John 1 through 6, has the most consistent understanding of signs of, and their relationship to the argument of John of any commentary that is out there. And I will initially start with a section where I will talk about some of the special things that he saw and where he emphasized the issue of signs. So we'll start by looking at his upper level outline since I know that uh, most of you don't have a copy in your hands to look at so we'll uh, present his higher level points in his outline and by the way FIHN stands for this book. Then we will look at parts of the purpose statement, John 20, 30, and 31, that are well represented in Zane's outline. Then we will consider parts of the purpose statement that have not by anyone. This is not, uh, say, this is not in particular a critique of Zane, but it's a critique of everyone. There is something that we have underemphasized in the purpose statement that I think affects how we understand the whole book. So I'll be bringing that out. And so I'll be starting with a critique, but then we'll look at the solution. So let's first look at the upper level outline that Zane's commentary has. Starts out with a prologue, and as I argued in my previous paper on Tuesday, the prologue goes 1, 1 through 14. I'm in complete agreement with Zane Hodges on that. I gave additional arguments in my earlier paper. Then Zane sees chapter 1 from verse 15 through 51 as an introduction. So notice you have an introduction and an introduction. <laughs> And look at the bottom. You have an epilogue and you have a conclusion. So it's really a doubled introduction and a doubled conclusion. The body of the book, Zane sees as going from chapter 2, verse 1, through chapter 20, verse 29. Purpose statement is a separate point, verses 30 and 31. Okay, let's look now at parts of the purpose statement that are well represented. And this is going to show us a focus on the word signs as being in the purpose statement and carrying all the way through the body of the book. 
and we'll see how Zane saw each sign contributing to the purpose statement. Then we will ask, well, how is it that signs are the focus of each section of the book? Well, we have to start first with the purpose statement. Thus Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these, and implicitly since we have a neuter plural form, these signs. And in John's Gospel there are eight signs. Now you might need a bit of a review on the eight signs. See there was this uh, banquet, and at the banquet there was a boy. And the banquet is looking, chapter 2, at the uh, wedding feast. Then in chapter 4, near the end, you have a boy who was at the point of death. So you have banquet and you have a boy. Now what did they uh, have to eat at this banquet? Bread and butter. I did not say bread and butter. <laughs> you have the feeding of the 5,000 out of the loaves and fishes. That's the bread part of it. But then Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee without a boat, and then he transported his disciples in a boat, but they weren't going through the water. They immediately arrived at the destination where they were headed. So bread and boater. So you have... <laughs> you have the banquet, and at this banquet there was a boy, and at the banquet they had bread and boater. But now you see there was a problem, and the problem was that, uh, oh, I forgot sign number three, I'm sorry. I forgot that uh, we had a, a fellow there at the banquet with a bum leg. That's chapter five, the man who was uh, lame for 38 years. Okay, we have the eight signs. Eight signs are receiving great emphasis, as we see here in the purpose statement. So let's now look at the outline that Zane has once again. And notice how much he emphasizes the word signs. The body of the book is the witness of signs. First sign, second and third signs. So he's not looking at it as sign number two, sign number three, but signs two and three. And we'll see why he did that. And then signs four and five, then six, then seven, then eight. Great emphasis on the signs as the proof that leads a person to believe in Jesus Christ for his free gift of everlasting life. Well, let's now look at some statements that Zane makes within the book. Let's see how he sees uh, John chapter 1, verses 40 and 41 tying to the purpose statement. Zane says, Andrew announces that he and the other disciple, note the word we, have made a discovery. Their discovery is nothing less than the truth this book was written to proclaim. See John 20, 30 and 31. They said, we have found the Messiah. And so Zane consistently within this outline, uh, he works Back to the outline, he says every part of the book contributing to the outline of the book. Uh, later, and let's see, offhand, I did not mark here in this what the verse reference was where he's saying this, but in the notes, I can uh, clarify that later. As John states clearly in the uh, in John 20, 30, and 31, he has selected, actually it's his overall statement introducing his commentary on the body. Uh, he has selected the signs recorded in this book for the specific purpose of bringing readers to believe that Jesus is the Christ. When he talks about 2, 18, and 19, he says it certainly is no accident that the purpose statement of this gospel occurs immediately after the famous account where Doubting Thomas is invited to inspect the physical evidence for Jesus' resurrection. The resurrection, therefore, is a consummating sign in John's Gospel. In chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, the Judean officials challenge Jesus and they say, 
What sign do you do that gives you the right to cleanse the temple? And he says, destroy this sanctuary, and in three days I will raise it up. And John tells us he was speaking of the sanctuary of his body. Notice I did not translate it temple. There are distinct words for the holy place and holy of holies that uh, John uses, and I render that always in my translation as sanctuary. John also uses a word for the temple precincts. Then in relation to John 2, 23 and 24, where it says that many believed in Jesus when they saw the signs that he did, but then later it says that Jesus did not entrust himself to them. Zane's comments on that passage. During this visit to Jerusalem that John is describing, many people believed in Jesus' name. They did this because of the signs they saw him do. This, of course, was precisely the aim of those signs, as is stated in 20, 30, and 31. As a result, these people obtained eternal life. I have to comment on how Lucas Kitchen paraphrased as he worked with a uh, version of my translation, how he paraphrased 2.24, where it uh, would in the text say, Jesus did not entrust himself to them. Lucas picked up on the meaning of it. He did not befriend them. He did not entrust himself to them for ministry. You know, a lot of people, as we know, uh, say they weren't, they didn't really receive eternal life. They didn't really believe. But let me ask you a question. When did Jesus entrust himself to the 11. That didn't happen until the last discourse. So it's not a statement of, oh, well, these are uh, a special class of uh, non-believers. It's rather, these are brand new believers. Jesus cannot befriend them. He cannot entrust himself to them for ministry. Not yet. Chapter 4, verse 2, uh, which says that uh, Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. It's my sense that uh, commentaries haven't figured out why that verse is there. <laughs> uh, I think everything that Zane says here is right. I think we can go a little further. It says that Jesus knew that the Pharisees knew that his ministry was bigger than John's. Well, how much bigger was it than John's? Jesus couldn't do all the baptizing himself. He had to delegate it. When you look at John baptizing, John's numbers are such that John baptizes himself. Jesus has huge numbers, and he had to entrust it to his disciples to do it. But Zane's point is absolutely on target. Baptism has no significant role at all in this gospel, which is so carefully designed to bring readers into eternal life. Purpose statement. Then in John chapter 4, verse 42, uh, where we have the confession of the men of Sychar, John now conclu uh, concludes his narrative as well as this unit of his gospel with the confession of the men of Sychar. They now believe that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. This confession, of course, expresses the very result that John seeks from this book. And he cites the purpose statement. And what about John? 536, where he talks about the very works that the Father has given him. The very works that he does, Jesus states, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. I didn't come on my own. I was sent. I didn't just went. Uh, thus, these works are designed to bring people to believe that he is God's Christ and thereby to receive eternal life. Zane would have had statements like this throughout the commentary if he had been able to complete it. But death cut that short. So, he's not able to do that for the rest of these signs through the book. But notice, he sees every sign in relation to the purpose statement. That's something you don't find in commentary literature on John. So how is it that the signs are the focus of each section of the book? How is it that Zane didn't do what most commentaries do. Oh, there's a discourse here, so we'll make an outline point. 
And then there's a sign here, okay, we'll make a point. Then there's a little discussion here, we'll make a point, we'll make a point. Why is it that when he looked at points, the points were arranged around a sign, even though there's a lot of ancillary material? How is it that the signs are the organizing principle of the outline? Well, we don't have time to talk about what Zane said in his two articles in 2008 about his introduction to the last discourse. But John 13 through 17 is not a discipleship manual for believers. It was designed to reinforce the 11, to make it so that they would be able to stand despite all the terrible things that were going to happen before they saw Jesus resurrected. But it's also designed so that unbelievers reading that book can say, yes, Jesus anticipated his death. He came to it courageously. He faced it knowing that he's in control, knowing that death was not going to defeat him, knowing that he is eternal life, knowing all the promises that he makes to believers, and it is designed evangelistically to bring unbelievers to consider Jesus Christ. That eighth sign, the cross and resurrection that is laying the groundwork for, is intended to be in that presentation to bring unbelievers to believe in Jesus Christ for everlasting life. Zane did a much more complete job of discussing that. I leave it to his two articles on that. And but, one of his conference uh, lectures was yes, on that. Yes, 2008. Very beautiful. Okay, so now the question also arises, why is it that Zane didn't just look at this sign, this sign, this sign? What is the justification for joining signs two and three, and four and five. In the commentary, Zane makes note that they are back to back without an explanation following. That what normally happens is you have the sign itself and then you have a section of discourse that clarifies. But what you have in the second sign is that a man, uh, a royal official in the Herodian uh, government, goes over to Cana of Galilee where Jesus is because his son is at the point of death. And Jesus told him that he didn't need to come down to Capernaum. He said, go your way, your son lives. That word, your son lives, shows up three times in that passage. Immediately after that, we have Jesus at an unnamed feast down in Jerusalem. And there is a man who has been lame for 38 years. And Jesus tells the man, rise up, pick up your mat, and walk. Zane points out something fascinating. In Jesus' discourse that follows the second of those signs, that is, we have two and three that are back to back, we have an explanatory discourse that shows up after that. Jesus speaks about resurrection and life. Oh, your son lives. And then he tells the man, rise up using one of the words that the Gospel of John does use for resurrection. The two signs are each pointing to one half of the concept of resurrection and life. Zane argued that with back-to-back -back signs, with an explanation of both, that that was what was going on. I would also say in chapter 6, which Unfortunately, Zane wasn't able to complete the commentary because he died uh, fairly early in the chapter. But with signs four and five, we have Jesus feeding the 5,000 
plus women and children. And what was the response of some of the people? They said, this truly is the prophet who is to come, John 6, 14. That is a statement that Jesus is the greater than Moses prophet like Moses. You know, Moses was able to tell people how to get the manna, and he could tell people how to get the quail. But was he making the food? Uh, Jesus started out with a little bit of boy's lunch, and there's so much abundance that he sent out the disciples in an object lesson with 12 baskets, and each one of them filled their basket with crumbs. Uh, what they started out with was less than what ended up as the crumbs after they were finished. And the people were satisfied. They ate all that they wanted to eat. Jesus is greater than Moses. And then we have Jesus rescues the disciples across the sea. Well, Moses could tell people, uh, you know, stand here uh, and we'll see the deliverance of the Lord. And the Red Sea was open. But Jesus teleported his disciples across the sea. There they are in the boat, and the boat immediately arrives at his destination. Flying boat. <laughs> and Jesus also proclaims himself in the discourse to be greater than Moses. So when there are signs that are back to back, we have an explanation that follows. All of this is showing that what we have in John is a showing of the sign, and then we have explanation of it. And in two cases, we have two signs that receive a unified explanation that covers both. These are fantastic features of Zane's commentary. As I say, this is my best commentary on John, my go-to one. But there are some areas for more attention. Some areas that I wish that I could have had continuing discussion with Zaid. You know, it turned out when I read the manuscript a year before it was published, it felt like Zayn and I were having a conversation. I came to understand a few words that he had written in 2008 that I thought I understood. But when I read his commentary, I said, oh, I see what he was seeing. Unfortunately, he's not going to be able to read my paper. At least I don't think so. So we're, we're not going to have the continuing dialogue, but at least I was able to look and say, the dialogue did continue after his death. I was able to see a little more of his thinking. And so I want to carry the point a little further because I believe that Zane laid a foundation that can be built on. And so, as you look at this, you notice that I have de-emphasized the body and the purpose statement. What we're looking at is the double introduction and the double conclusion. And I think that's a little odd. And I think John gives us a clue that resolves that issue. So, purpose statement. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these signs done in the presence of his disciples are written. Have you ever heard that part of the purpose statement receive attention? No. I think it will affect our outline of the book. Now, one of the problems with PowerPoints is I have to either make my type microscopic or I can only show a half at a time. So what I'm arguing is that John 1.15 through 51 is the first bookend and the second bookend will be chapter 20 verses 11 uh, through chapter 21, 23. So now if we look at uh, Zane's outline in relation to that, we have an introduction to the book. That's chapter 1, starting at verse 15. The first part of that is John the Baptist's testimony. 
And what Zane argues is that, Z that uh, John the Baptist was sent by God to testify. And his testimony resulted in three of his disciples giving direct testimony to Jesus Christ. We have the testimony of Andrew that shows up in the text. We also have the testimony of Philip. And finally, we have the testimony of Nathaniel. So you can look at those and look at the quotation marks and you can see the uh, testimonies that they gave. So God sent John to testify and his testimony resulted in three testimonies by new disciples of Jesus. I think that they were already Old Testament believers and that before this point, so this isn't the point they received life, but this is the point where they know that the Messiah is Jesus instead of it's the coming one that was announced by John. So I will argue something and it isn't entirely my thoughts. Uh, we, I've had meetings with two people at the Denver Rescue Mission, Lon Gregg and uh, Steve Walkup. We've met just about weekly since 2011 and have worked very heavily on John's Gospel, on Matthew's Gospel, on Acts and Romans. One of the times that we were working on John's Gospel, Lon Gregg said, okay, this discussion that we're having right now on the end of John 1, 15 through 51, I think that it's balanced by something going on with Mary Magdalene. Okay, so if we look at the left side and then the right side. In John 1, 7, God sent John the Baptist to testify. And then Jesus, in John 20, 17, sent Mary Magdalene and said that she was to testify to the, the brethren, to the disciples, and to Peter. And then... In 135, John the Baptist testified to his disciples, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He did that earlier. And then the next day, Behold the Lamb of God, and two of his disciples turned to follow Jesus. Well, Mary Magdalene testified to either the ten or to the eleven. Uh, we don't know if Thomas was present there. He wasn't present uh, on the first appearance that's uh, mentioned, so I'm not sure if he was there. So it's either to 10 or 11 in 218. Well, then in chapter 1, we saw Andrew <coughs> testified, but then we have an attested appearance uh, to the 10, not including Thomas. Then we have a second appearance in which Thomas also is present. And then we have an appearance on the Sea of Galilee to seven. But I'd like for you to take a look at John chapter 21, verse 14. And notice something that is going to play an important role. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. What has John told us? I am looking at a unit of three appearances. Has he not done that? Is he not connecting this with the two appearances in John chapter 20? I mean, when he calls attention, this is now, he could have said, uh, Jesus appeared. Uh, that's all he had to say, but he says, this is the third appearance. He's saying, we've got a group of three appearances. Three appearances to the disciples. He didn't say, this is the third appearance, because remember, Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene. But it's the third appearance to the disciples. And back in chapter 1, we had John testifying before his disciples, and that caused a change that made it so that his disciples started going after Jesus and wanting to hear from him directly. 
There's an analogy between the role of John the Baptist at the beginning of the book and the role of Mary Magdalene at the end of the book. Wow, I mean, you know, the, the, this is just a really fascinating thing. And what's the importance of this? Jesus did his signs in the presence of his disciples so that they could go and testify these signs that John has recorded in this book have really happened and Jesus indeed is the Messiah, the Son of God, the life-giving one. And if you believe in him, you get everlasting life. For them to be able to testify in a court of law this has happened is an extremely important thing. John doesn't start showing signs until after Jesus has started accumulating disciples. There he is accumulating disciples in chapter 1, and where's the first sign? Chapter 2. And John says, these eight signs, we have seen them. We're witnesses. Now, we've seen 21.14 is saying that all three of these signs are, I mean, all three of these appearances here, starting in chapter 20, all the way here into chapter 21 are a unit. And then we have that inclusio where we have the role of John the Baptist being analogous to the role of Mary Magdalene. Now, everyone's outline of John's gospel, everyone's outline has all of John 20 in the body of the book. If that is part of a unit, we've got three appearances to the disciples. If any of that's in the body, all of it has to be in the body, doesn't it? Because John has joined it into a unit. And furthermore, if that's part of the body about John the Baptist's role and the testimonies given by uh, Mary Magdalene uh, giving the testimony to the disciples and then the disciples are there in a position to be able to testify that yes, Jesus has appeared. Wouldn't we expect that John 1, 15 through 51 would also be part of the body of the book. You have nine minutes uh, for questions and for closing. Real close. But, but, here's my, but here's my suggestion. We had a last minute cancellation, so we have a, a room, extra room. Sure. And would you, would you want to give an impromptu another, would you like to give sure. another lecture? Because I'd like to hear more personally. <laughs> Sure. Uh, but we'd have to move to the other room. Okay, that would be but fine. We have nine minutes. Sean. Yeah. Dad and I were going to do the missions thing, so we can just go to the other room. Can you move him to the other room? Yeah, way he can stay. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. So, we can compare outlines. Uh, you know, I, in a sense, this feels, it feels to me like I'm having a discussion with Zane and saying, have you considered? Some of Zane's favorite words. <laughs> and so we used to do that. And so I, I looked at his commentary and I looked at his outline and it laid a foundation. It, it just laid a fascinating foundation and we're just building on it a little bit. So I have in white uh, the main points of his outline with the doubled introduction and the doubled conclusion. Uh, let me uh, I'll also highlight one other change I made. Notice if you look at my outline at the bottom, I have divided the body into two parts, an A part and a B part. And the reason for this is I believe the first half of the book emphasizes the first seven signs but the greatest of all signs is the cross and resurrection. 
and all the way from chapter 13 through the end of the body of the book is focused on one sign, the culminating sign. It balances the first seven. And so I have that, I thought that that was worth uh, showing in my outline. But I see the prologue is going through verse 14 and to clarify, okay, well, where then does 1, 15 through 51 appear? I mean, wh why, where would that go in the outline? I will argue that it lays the groundwork for the first sign, turning water into wine. I'd like for us to look at another verse that drops through on the commentary literature, and I don't think, I don't think it's understood why John 2.12 is there. I mean, it's one of those verses you look at and you say, uh, well, that could have been left out of there. <laughs> Jesus has just turned water into wine. It's the beginning of his signs. He starts doing signs after accumulating disciples. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. And I say, wow, I could do a sermon on that one. <laughs> I could. I could do a sermon on that verse. Yeah. We can tell very early that Jesus' mother wasn't saying, hey, could you go down to the uh, store and buy some wine? And she said, they've run out of wine. How do we know that she was asking for more? How do we know that she was asking for him to do a sign? Because Jesus said, ma'am, <laughs> notice my translation's different than most. Ma'am, uh, what is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. He's saying, uh, uh, does that really concern me? Uh, is that really our, our issue? Uh, you want me to reveal myself, but my hour has not yet come. And he's going to do things on the Father's timetable, which fortunately, his Father's timetable ended up also meeting the needs of his earthly mother. Okay, his mother clearly believes. I mean, after all, she had a kind of an important part in Jesus coming into the world. <laughs> yeah, she, she, she knows that he's, uh, he's special. <laughs> and we're told in verse 11 that his disciples believed in him. I don't think this is his disciples came to believe in him. I think the sense here is he has believing disciples. I think that's the sense of it. It's not, they came to, but the idea is they are believers. Who else accompanied Jesus on that day's walk to Capernaum? His brothers. John chapter seven, which is two and a half years later, we're told that they still did not believe in him. I think if you ask, what would be the topic of conversation as they left that wedding? Oh, didn't the bride have a nice gown? <laughs> I think the topic of conversation from that wedding is going to be, wow. Uh, can you imagine what the brothers were thinking? Oh. <clears throat> We've had to live with him all these years and it's only going to get worse. John doesn't say anything about their spiritual status here. But we have indication they were exposed to the evidence proving who Jesus is. And they were holding it off. So, I've... I think that uh, 
this opens up uh, some very interesting possibilities in John's Gospel when we understand an expansion of the book. But let me point out, Zane argued that the entire body of the book, the entire body of the book was signs related. And I would argue, yes, the entire body of the book is signs related, but the body of the book is bigger than anyone has thought it was. And it's, I think it opens up some new avenues. We have not emphasized the importance of in the presence of his disciples. There are other ramifications of this. So.